Hello my friends and welcome back to part two of 20 things you didn't know about Star Trek Insurrection. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture and let's get straight to it. Number 10. Patrick Stewart held a lot of sway on Star Trek Insurrection. After returning to the film franchise as a producer as well as an actor this time around, Patrick Stewart was able to influence the story of the film. This didn't cause issues so much as it added a series of delays to pre-production. This was due mainly to his suggestions for story ideas. One of his ideas, that the crew of the Enterprise E defend the Baku village in the style similar to the Battle of the Alamo, was nixed from the film. It was deemed too logistically difficult and the original version of the villagers' flight into the hills was kept instead. The final version of the script was given to everyone bar Stewart, which made Rick Berman very nervous at this oversight. He worried that this would make the man feel deliberately excluded. Thankfully, the first that he heard about it was when LeVar Burton called him to praise the script. He called a meeting with Michael Piller, who attended nervously, but the only further notes were on several lines of dialogue. Number 9. The Pitch Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is many things, but light it is not. So, when Rick Berman and Michael Piller chose to use it as a jumping off point for the film that they wanted to be lighter in tone than what had come before, this left people scratching their heads a little. To quote Piller, they knew it would be foolish to outborg the Borg and a curveball was needed to be thrown. In Heart of Darkness, a team is sent to retrieve a man who has gone mad in the jungle. In Heart of Lightness, as Piller jokingly called it, Picard is sent to retrieve a friend of his from the Academy. He has apparently turned mutineer against Starfleet and is attacking ships in the Briar Patch. When the Enterprise E arrives, they find that he looks exactly the same as Picard remembers him from all those years before. This was the same Fountain of Youth premise that evolved into the Baku planet itself. The idea of Picard's Academy friend melted away though, eventually being replaced with a shady Starfleet Admiral instead. Number 8. It was the first Star Trek film that didn't use practical models. Star Trek Insurrection was the first film in which all of the space-based scenes in the franchise were achieved using CGI. Though a practical model of the Enterprise E had been constructed for Star Trek First Contact, it was not used in this film save for reference photos to build the CGI model. The Enterprise E is a mostly impressive construct, though the years have been a little unkind to it. At the time, it was cutting edge. It was designed by John Eves and built by Santa Barbara Studios, who also built the rest of the starships, the sonar, the scout ship and the captain's yacht. However, However, they failed to archive the ships and they used their own software. The company has since gone out of business, which meant that the original designs were all but lost. They had also worked on elements of Deep Space Nine and Voyager, as well as the opening scene of the Enterprise B in the champagne bottle in Star Trek Generations. Number 7. The Sona were a calculated attempt to reach a younger demographic. The Sona, renamed from an earlier version that saw them called the Sony, appear in this film as the main villains. The first draft had featured the Romulans, who at that time had not yet appeared in the movie franchise as a primary antagonist. However, the producers went cold on them, with these new, younger villains taking their place. The Sona were hedonistic and loved life. A cut line from the script described them as loving wine, women and song. However, their obsession with enjoyment and the lost youth on the Baku planet led them to experiment with de-aging. The skin-stretching techniques were deliberate nods to plastic surgery culture. Ironically, this meant that the filmmakers wanted to cast younger actors and age them, which in turn, they believed, would attract younger audiences to the film. It had varying levels of success. The film did do well in its initial weekend and for a couple of weeks after, but then quickly dropped off. Number 6. It was finally time for the crew to receive fancy new dress uniforms. The dress uniforms for the Next Generation crew were first introduced in the Season 1 episode, Lonely Among Us, serving as a variation of the regular coloured uniforms that the crew wore from week to week. This evolved, but only slightly, over the course of the show. For this film, costume designer Robert Blackman wanted to go slightly old school. His initial design for the Insurrection uniforms was inspired by old naval ideas. The first scene for the Next Generation crew in Star Trek Generations saw them in a literal navy uniform, and Blackman liked the blue jackets, shorter and trim. However, once he sat down to really think about it, he turned on the idea altogether. Next, he came up with a colour palette for the film. He believed that white on black would always pop, no matter the situation. Therefore, the white short jacket made its first appearance, sitting atop the high-waisted black trousers. The only real variation was that Picard wore an all-white variant, while the rest of the crew wore two-tone jackets. Number 5. He's back, back, back again. Jerry Goldsmith to the rescue. Star Trek Insurrection was Jerry Goldsmith's fourth Star Trek score, and it reuses many of the themes that originated in the motion picture. The main Enterprise theme, along with the Klingon March, both make an appearance. So too does Alexander Courage's six-note motif. The soundtrack features a brand new theme for the Baku, no theme for the Sona. This was deliberate. Goldsmith wanted to include a cue in the score that the Sona and the Baku were the same race. Therefore, there is only an action cue that plays over their scenes, one interchangeable with the rest of the action music in the film. The Baku theme that appears in the first scene sets 
the scene for the lighter tone of the film compared to Star Trek First Contact, with opened with a sinister rendition of what would become the Borg theme. The Baku theme then reappears at the end of the film as things have been set to rights again. This will be Goldsmith's second to last project for Star Trek as he would return for Star Trek Nemesis. Number four, a British tar is a soaring soul. There are a couple of conflicting accounts as to how Picard, Worf and Data ended up singing Gilbert and Sullivan in the final film. All agree that Picard had to distract Data long enough for the other two to capture him. One suggestion had Picard and Data quoting King Lear rather than singing altogether. This would call back to episodes of The Next Generation while also serving as a nod to Stewart's Shakespearean pedigree. However, Stewart claimed he was against it. He then said that he suggested something like Tony Bennett which would give Brent Spiner a chance to show off his tenor. Berman and Pillar felt that it was corny and Stewart says that Pillar's suggested Gilbert and Sullivan, while Pillar stated that it was the other way around. Both men agree, however, that Stewart was not a fan of the composers. Despite his misgivings, Stewart agreed to HMS Pinafore after his first idea, Three Little Maids, was shot down for being too vulgar. Once he saw the finished product, he admitted that in the end, Berman and Pillar had made the right call after all. Number three, A Beautiful Sunrise. There is one scene in Star Trek Insurrection that stands out, which is of course the sunrise scene featuring Geordi the Forge using his new eyes for the first time. Though the character had managed to ditch the visor in Star Trek First Contact, this scene marked one of the very few times that LeVar Burton got to appear without any prosthetics or appendages over his eyes in Star Trek. The scene was included not to make LeVar Burton's life any easier, but to make Captain Picard's life more difficult. Rick Berman initially wasn't sold on the idea of having the Forge's eyes regenerate, feeling that it was a little too heavy on the emotional side of things. However, Pillar managed to argue his case successfully, he felt that if Picard had to make the choice of asking his officer to give up his eyes, it would help give him a bit of pause, but that ultimately he would decide to go ahead with saving the Baku, thus giving him an even greater ethical and moral standing. Once the script was shown to Berman as finished and the rest of the executives, they all agreed that it was one of the best scenes in Star Trek Insurrection. Number two, the original ending. Michael Piller had serious concerns about the first ending of the script, as he felt it was too similar to the ending of Star Trek Generations. Both films came to a close with Picard fighting the villain in hand-to-hand -hand combat, along with both films featuring the villain dying at the controls of their own weapons. The original version of The Collector also saw a device shot into a star rather than the rings. Piller changed the weapon's target and then switched the circumstances of Ruafo's death. Most importantly, there is a moment before the character's death that sees Picard extend a hand to help him escape, only for them to realise a moment too late that there's too great of a physical distance between them. Ruafo would then be on board the injector as it harnesses the radiation from the rings, growing younger and younger until fading into nothing. This version was shot, but only to be replaced with a more action-centric ending eventually featured in the film, something closer to the generation's ending after all. Number one, the test audience loved the humour and killed that ending. Michael Piller recalled being extremely nervous as test screenings began. The audience had been pulled together from various street corners and pavements in Los Angeles and represented a mix of both Star Trek fans and those who weren't familiar with the franchise. Piller sat there knowing that it would not score as well as First Contact had, but still hoped for the best. He relaxed as the film went on, as the audience seemed to be enjoying the humour of the piece. When the screening was over, Piller felt that it went really well. The executives did not. They felt that the film's pacing was completely off. They also felt that there was no sufficient climax to the film. This was a belief shared by the test audience. Although they did like Picard's romance, Roafo's final fate, though still in its early stages of post-production effects, was immediately scrapped, as several members of the audience weren't even sure that he had died or not. With barely any time to spare, several million dollars were dropped on reworking the ending. The film's budget came in at roughly $70 million, and it went on to gross about $117 million. This was lower than both generations and First Contact, though still high enough to greenlight Star Trek Nemesis. I wonder how that one went. And that's everything for our list. If you missed it, please don't forget to check out part one of this list. Remember that you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture and you can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Now you look after yourselves until I'm talking to you again. You look after your friends and family and stay safe. Just stay safe. Thank you very much. Live long and prosper. You all are awesome.